turned out. Uh, we did the morning conditions with Ray, what have you, so I'm very, very, very grateful for such a good showing. Uh, my name is Chris, Chris French, I'm chairman of the Mid-Sussex Assembly. We're a local organisation, grassroots group. Um, we number about 200 of members now on Telegram, you can find us there. And we've got some leaflets that we circulate in, and there's some more by the door if you want to take on the way with you. And, and we would be able to do if you want, might want to consider joining us. And what we're about is we are a group that's, that's very diversified. You know, we have trades, professionals, lawyers, accountants, we've got tradespeople as well. People from all walks of life, retired, teachers, nurses, uh, and so on. And we're united perhaps in, in the sense of we question, we question deeply um, government policies, you know, towards COVID-19 in a nutshell. And so we look at that and we, we, we take action local, you know, local outreach, so to speak. So we're very active in that sense. And if you want to participate in that, you're all welcome, obviously. Um, one thing to, to, to also mention is that on many of these chairs, there's a copy of this document here. This is issued by an organisation called Together, and it's a very important organisation, very close to my heart. And what this organisation is doing is that they are standing up for the um, NHS workers. As you may know, there, there are mandated vaccines that these guys have got to take. And there's some extraordinary numbers involved of people who, have, who are refusing, you know, quite rightly, um, it's their body after all, they have sovereignty over, over it, and they do not want to take, as they, as they see it, an experimental um, drug into their bodies. And apparently the number is something like 100,000 or some extraordinary figure of NHS workers who are basically threatened with the sack if they don't comply. I mean, it's unprecedented, it's unheard of, it's, it's disgusting. So yeah, please, if you get a chance, pick up a copy of this, or if you haven't already, sign the declaration. It's, it's, on, it's on the web, search for Google, find it that way, and it's all together. Right, our guest tonight is um, Dave Murphy. Yeah. yeah. Also known as the Legend Dave. So let's have a brief round of applause for Dave. Dave, as he says on his website, and I highly recommend his website to you, which is simply legendydave.com. Yeah. He's a very interesting character. Um, he's, in his own words, he's an ordinary guy who's had a very extraordinary life, I suppose. A lot of very unusual experiences. And so, in, very, in a nutshell, um, if you don't mind me saying, Dave, um, according to your website, I'm, I'm sure this is gospel truth, is it, it, essentially Dave has had a very interesting life, as I say, and he worked um, very hard, and he worked for um, Fortune 500 companies in New York. He comes to Patterson originally, and he did extremely well. There are photographs on his website of a bright red Ferrari, you know, he's doing extremely well in life, he made an awful lot of money. And was enjoying material things in life. He was happy married at that time and so forth. And then in 2001, he was based in New York and you know, the awful um, um, Twin Towers and that incident. He was, he was working obviously, weren't he, the Twin Towers, I believe. And obviously, you know, it worked very well what happened on 9 11. And that was part of a sort of wake up call. And he started to realise perhaps one of the most important things in life, you know, other than material possessions and so forth. And that was a. a yeah, very important turning point, not many of the turning points in your life. So, without further ado, time is of the essence, and I know David said to me he's going to try and cram five hours worth of, of a normal talk into a couple of hours tonight. So, uh, without any further delay, let's do it today. Uh, I guess I don't have to tell you who I am. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, so, I kind of like um, audience participation. Yeah, all right? So uh, let's not be silent, okay? So, um, as, as Chris said, uh, my, my normal common law talk is about eight hours long. And you guys have got eight hours, so I'm going to try and squeeze it all into two hours. All right, so I might have to go at great next speed, okay? Um, so, before we start, I want you all to tell me what a curved yellow fruit is. All of you. Banana. One more time. Banana. Good. Okay. Now I want all of you to stand up. Stand up, please. <laughs> yes, I am a dictator. You win. Stand up. No, um, now I want you for a few seconds to stand on one leg. Just for a few seconds. Everyone doing that? 
Ok, you can sit down. Thank you very much. <laughs> ok, so what, what is common law? Common law is essentially natural law written down, or the most highest law. Yeah, we call it God, God's law. Ok, we all know what that is. We all have that written on our hearts. Yeah, we all know what's right and what's wrong. Okay? So common law is, is essentially the Ten Commandments boiled down. Okay? It boils down to do not cause harm, injury or loss to people or their property. And you know, don't be fraudulent in your contract, so don't lie. Okay? That's it. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's it. If you break these simple rules, that is what's known as a crime. Okay? It's important for you to get that because, you know, these days the police and the government are trying to make everything criminal. But the point is, if there's no injured party, there is no crime. Okay? So, um, as I said, uh, everyone, knows, everyone knows what's right and what's wrong. Even the psychopaths know, but they just don't care. Okay? Now, there's, some, there's another thing called universal law, and this becomes very, becomes very important because um, the, the powers that be go to an awful lot of uh, uh, extraordinary lengths to avoid universal law. There's a universal law that says everything that you put out there is going to come back at you, multiplied. I don't know if you can anybody see the screen, it's very small for those at the back. Those people in the cheap seats, can you see the screen? Yeah, good, good. Okay. Right, so yes, any, everything you put out there is going to come back at you, multiplied. So if I was to, um, if I was to say, punch Dave, Davey in the face there, right? Yeah, if I, if I come up and punch Dave in the face, right, is that a crime? Is that a crime? Yes. yes. Crying out loud. Right, yes, it is a crime. Yeah. Um, it's also going to invoke universal law because I don't know if I punch David in the face, right, I'm probably going to trip off at that stage and bash my face in seven times worse than David got. Right? That's universal law. People call it karma, it's more, it's more direct than that. Okay? But what if I, I said to Dave, David, do you mind if I punch you in the face? Not at all. So, when I punch him in the face, is that a crime? No. No, because he agreed to it. Yeah? And is it going to come back on me? No. No, because we made an agreement and I just held up my part of the agreement. So, you'll notice, right, um, in this world, uh, the, the powers that be, before they do anything, right, most people say that they tell us about it. No, they don't just tell us about it. They get our agreement first. Then they do it, and then it doesn't come back on them. Okay. So along with this uh, idea of the, the law that's written in your hearts, okay, is a whole body of case law. That is decisions made by juries over the centuries to deal with all the nuances uh, around common law. Simple, simple as that. The juries make decisions on these little nuances, you know, between cause no harm, injury or loss. Okay? So that's what it is. It's just a whole bunch of case law spanning centuries. Okay? Now I say that juries make the decisions, not, not judges. Because judges in a courtroom do not have power. The power, who, who is the um, highest authority in the land? Anyone know? We are! We are! Yes, we are. We, are. we the people, are the highest authority in the land. And a jury of 12 ordinary people is representing the rest of us. So in the court, they are the highest authority in the land. And this is where the power is. Yeah? Um, and it's like this image, yeah? there's the politician, but the queen can be there, the police can be there too. Yeah? We give them our authority. Right? And as soon as we lose interest and walk away, they're going down. They get their power from us, okay? And this is, this is a very important thing, again, to get, because 
You know, we've been brainwashed from, from, from almost birth to believe that we are lower than low. And all these officers and politicians and everybody else are above us. It's not true. We have the power. They, brought, they gain their authority from us. Okay? So this is, this is how it works. The world is separated into two parts here. We have what's lawful and what's legal. Lawful is about common law. Okay? Um, it's the law of the land. And on the other side, kind of mirroring what, what, what's in real life, is the fake. It's the statutes and acts for maritime admiralty law, the law of the sea. Okay? So the legal system is like a thin veneer over the top of common law, which is the real law. Okay? So lawful is anything that doesn't cause harm, injury or loss, fraud or threat. So you can do anything you like, as long as you don't harm anyone. So you can strip off naked and walk, run down the high street screaming if you like. That's not against the law. Yeah, well, for some people it should be, but you know. <laughs> um, but it's not against the law. Right? You can do anything you like, as long as you don't harm anyone. On the other side, legal is whatever the government allows you or licenses you to do. Yeah? One's expansive, the other one's restrictive. Okay? The uh, lawful side pertains to sovereign beings. All of you are sovereign beings. Okay? You are kings and queens without subjects. Right? Um, and law, the law applies to you. On the other side, the legal system only applies to government employees and corporate employees and anyone who consents to it. Okay? On the lawful side, you have rights. You have inalienable rights. Rights that can't be taken away from you. So you can certainly give them away if you want. And on the other side here, you are, you are granted privileges. And they can absolutely be taken away from you. You know, every time you are a naughty boy or girl, they'll take them away from you. Um, and on, on this side, the common law is upheld by constables. You remember the constables? Remember the Doc Dixon of Doc Green type? Who used to be the, the Bobby on the beat, who everyone in the neighbourhood would know? And he would know everybody in your neighbourhood? Yeah. yeah? He'd be the one who would, uh, you know, catch the kids grumping apples and give a click around the ear and say, don't do that again or I'm going to tell your mum. Yeah? But that got, uh, those guys got replaced by these people called police officers, policy enforcers, upholding, not upholding the law, but enforcing statutes and acts, which they're not actually allowed to do. Uh, we'll get to that later. Um, but uh, along with that, I don't know if you remember, but um, when we had these guys, it used to be called the police service. Then it morphed very slowly into a police force. Service force. Slight difference there, right? So, a statute uh, or act is defined as a legislated rule of society given the force of law, which should tell you right there, but it's not law. It gets the force of law by the consent of the government. Who's the government? Yeah. <laughs> Remember what I said about all these participation? <laughs> yeah. Yes, we are the government, so um, we give the consent to these laws. Now, the government will try and tell you that um, you've already given your consent because you voted for one of their politicians. Right? That's not true. Whenever you come up against the, uh, the, the law or the legal system, you're going to be asked for your consent there and then. Okay? And if you consent, well, now it becomes law to you. Okay? An example of that is if, um, if a policeman stops you and says, you know, I'm charging you for doing 50 and 30, do you understand? Ah, some of you know this already, yeah? So, yes. He says, do you understand? 
but he's not speaking in English, and we're going to get to, into this in a little later. But he's not speaking English. He's using the word understand that is, is legalese, foreign language. And it means to stand under, to consent, to agree to buy it, to be bound by it. Okay? So when you say yes to that, now you've consented. Now that law, that uh, statute becomes law to you. Do you get that? Yeah. Yes. Oh, one or two of you do. Good. Good. <laughs> So yes, if you agree or confess to being a government employee or a fictional entity created by government, then it becomes law to you. Okay, that just sums up what I was just saying. So, let's have a look at the hierarchy we're talking about here. So, above everybody, above everything, is the Creator, whoever you deem that to be. Okay? The Creator created us. Every man, woman and child on earth is at that level. There isn't a Rothschild or a Gates or a, a Rockefeller at, you know, above us. No, they're all at the same level. The sovereign being level. Okay? We collectively create a government. Government is under us. Yeah? Government is subservient to us. A creative thing is less than the creator. Okay? Government, in turn, creates all sorts of fictional entities. Citizen, driver, person, taxpayer, resident, voter, a driver. All these fictional entities that only exist on paper. The trick is to get you, in your sovereign capacity, and remember, above government, where government can't touch you, Get you to give up your sovereign status and accept a lower status as one of these things. Good evening, sir. Are you the driver of this vehicle? You say yes. Well, now you've given up your natural right to travel in any way you see fit to accept this, uh, this position as a driver. And that driver comes along with all sorts of rules, regulations, taxes, fees. Insurances, blah 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 blah. Okay, but you gave up your natural rights to accept that um, benefit privilege offered by government. Okay, so does it apply to you? So Tesco has a rule for its employees, especially if you're likely to work on a till. If you work for Tesco's, you're not allowed to walk into that shop with money in your pocket because obviously if you work in, on the tills. Tesco's don't know if the money's yours or came out of the till. So you're not allowed to walk into that store with money. If you don't work for Tesco's, does it apply to you? No, it doesn't. But let's say you were walking out, you used to work for Tesco's. And you walk in there one day and the security guard stops you and says, Don't you work for Tesco's? And absent mindedly you say, Yeah. Well, now you've confessed to working for Tesco's. And if you've got money in your pocket, that security guard can grab you and apply whatever punishment uh, would go, go along with that. Because you confessed. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, or, you know, it's right or wrong. You confessed. Okay? That works in this system as well. So, if you identify, okay, this is another legal fiction word, uh, uh, a legalese word, identify, you might think it means recognise. No, it means to make the same as, yeah? Which is, make the same as one of these. So if you identify as a fictional entity, you create something called joinder. Yeah, you join yourself to this fictional entity. And now, um, government can do whatever they like with you. Alright, so the government assumes that you are an employee or citizen of the government. Okay? So, is there any evidence that you are a government employee? Do you think there's evidence of that? That you personally are a government employee? I think there is. This is, this is proof, that the, to the government at least, that you are one of their citizens or persons or employees. A person is the, is the uh, straw man here in this case. A person is not what you think it is. You are not a person. You have a person. 
A person is a corporation, a dead entity. Corporation, the dead speaks. Yeah? So this is, this is evidence that you are something called a person. So this verse is good, right? Well, it's made up with this uh, thing called a first name and a surname. Do you have a first name and a surname? No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't have a first name. Well, you have a given name. You have a given name, a name given to you by your parents, and a family name. The government creates something called a first name in all capital letters, and a surname in all capital letters, and jams them both together. Because how many, how many songs in your life has somebody come up to you and said, um, to me, say, Hello, David Murphy. How are you, David Murphy? No, no they don't. They just say your, first, your given name, or maybe even a nickname. But they never ever jam the two you know, names together. Okay? The government did that. They created this thing called a person with your name in all capitals, yeah, as a first name and a surname. So, on the birth certificate, it actually says, warning. This certificate is not evidence of the identity of the person presenting it. It's not there for your identity. Yeah? It's also, somewhere on it has the words Crown Copyright, which means that name isn't yours. It belongs to the Crown. Yeah? And when, every time you use it, you're breaking the law. Okay? So when did this come about? It came about during the Great Fire of London. Okay? While the Great Fire of London was raging and uh, the Black Death was going, on, going around, okay, lots of people were dying left, right, centre. But while the fire was burning, Parliament sat. And Parliament enacted a, a piece of legislation in French, so the English wouldn't know what was in it, called the Cesse de Act of 1666. 1666. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so the Cesta Cave Act, 1666, what it did was, it declared that everyone was dead, because they didn't know who was dead or who was alive, they said, everyone is dead. So because everyone's dead, we, the government, are going to administer everybody's share of the country. So imagine, this country's, um, this country's natural wealth is in the trillions, okay? Now divide however many trillions that is by 67 million and uh, that's how much your share of the country's worth. Still something, some figure in the billions. Okay? That's why essentially everything in this country is prepaid for you. Because you own a share of the country. Okay? But the government, because of this act, has become the shareholder, your shareholder. Okay? Now in this act, they actually declared that, uh, or gave a provision that if you present yourself to the government before the age of seven, you can claim your share of the country back. But they didn't tell anybody that they could do that. And there's nothing in the, in the Act that tells you how to do it. And because it's in French, nobody knew that that was a, even a thing. Right? So, until this day, nobody knows how to do it. Okay? So, before the age of eight, uh, a boy has a title. Anybody know what the title is? Master. So what do you think a master is? Master is safe. Master is, yes, so a master cannot be imprisoned. A master can't be fined. A master can't be accosted in any way, just like a seven-year-old boy. Yeah? But if you don't present yourself, uh, you know, and uh, present yourself as being alive, then you get uh, another title after the age of eight. What's that? Mister. So what do you think that means? No, missed it. <laughs> That's a good one. No, it actually means, if you, if you look it up, it actually means somebody who's engaged in mystery. M-I-S-T-E-R-Y. So you look up mystery in the legal dictionary, it means a trade or business. So, in other words, a corporation. Okay? So the word mister means corporation. Women 
you're not really highly regarded in this system. So what's your first title? Miss. What do you think that means? Never hit the target. Now, it means miss out, ignore, no status whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, but that changes when you get married. So what title do you take on then? What do you think that means? Well, let's see, if I spelled it, M-R apostrophe S. Misters, belonging to the mister. Belonging to the trade or business. When you get married, it's a corporate merger between you, your partner, and the state. And the state have an interest in the products of that corporate merger, i.e. children. Okay? So, so this, is, this is how they trick us all the time with words, with word magic, and I'll get into that in a second. But um, it's all about consent and agreements, yeah? And they trick us all the time to get our consent, okay? So I want you to look at this image. Now I made this image myself, so I know, I know um, what's right. But these two circles are different. So I want you to tell me which is the biggest one, red or the blue? Red. So hands up, who's set, I'm going to find out who's, who's, right, who's right brain and who's left brain now. Um, so hands up, who says the red one is the biggest one? Okay. What about, and who says the blue is the bigger one? So a few more say blue. Okay, there's a lot of people who didn't put their hand up, really. So, so who, who says they're the same? Just give me some. Okay, what? You say they're the same. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I made this picture. Right? So they are different. So what, which one's the biggest one? Which one's the biggest one? No, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I made this myself, yeah? I did this myself, so which one's the biggest one? Sorry? <laughs> I'm telling you, right? I, I, know, I, know the, I know the answer here, because I made this, yeah? So, which one's the biggest one? Blue. Red. Red. I can't see the difference. I can't see the Right, well, the point is they are the same. <laughs> well, what I did for most of you there was word magic. Yeah? I said these circles are different. Well, they are. One's red, one's blue. And then I said, which one's the biggest one? I didn't lie to you. Yeah? I just used word magic. And there were some that I said, those of you who said that it was the same, I did use more word magic, and you, I didn't quite get you. But I got some of you. <laughs> I got some of you, even though you saw that they were the same, I got you to change your mind. Change your reality. And the thing is, sometimes when I do this, even when I say they're the same, there's some people go, I still think the red one's bigger. <laughs> yeah? Because that's how powerful this word magic is. Yeah? It is so powerful that a, a very clever hypnotist can hypnotise you or hypnotise some people and make them believe that an onion is an apple. And for them, it is their reality. You can't tell them. They're biting into that onion. You can't tell them that's an onion. They're going to say, oh, you're stupid, this is an apple. Right? That's how powerful it is. Okay? And we have the biggest hypnotist in the world yeah. in our front rooms. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There was a reason why they gave us all these TVs. I don't know if you remember, some of you remember, that uh, when, when TVs first came out, they were fabulously expensive. But then the government made sure that everyone could rent one for a pound a week, yeah, from Reinfusion or DER or something. I, there's a lot of people too young to remember that, but the point is, the, the government made sure that everybody had a TV. Yeah? They didn't do that for our benefit. None of it's for our benefit. It means they can program, program us en masse. Okay? Give us a false reality, just like this guy. Yeah? That's what it's there for. So here's the, here's the crux of the legal system. It's, it comes down to the language of the legal system. It's called legalese. Yeah? It's a foreign language. Even though it looks like English, sounds like English, right? it's a completely foreign language because all the words have been redefined to mean something else. Okay? So 
we want to break stuff. Okay, we all think we might know what that means. It means like to record. No, when you register something, you hand over title ownership of whatever you're registering with whoever you're registering with. So when you register your car, right, you're handing over ownership of that car to the DVLA. And you become the registered keeper. Keeper, not owner. Okay? The DVLA owns the car. When you register your child, you become the pair that rents them. Yeah. Okay? So, so literally, this is another what they call prima facie uh, piece of evidence that the government owns that child because you've handed over ownership to the government. I've already mentioned what person means, it's corporation. Um, the word identify, I've mentioned that as well to make the same as. The word notice. So you might get in the post like uh, notice of intended prosecution. Anybody got one of those? Yeah. Yeah. Come on, own up, yes you have. I know. <laughs> so you might get a notice of intended prosecution. So why don't they just say prosecution? Why well, am I giving you notice of intended prosecution? Well, the word notice means offer. It's an offer of a prosecution. Do you want to be prosecuted? Yeah? And if you don't, if you uh, miss the window for you to object, then they take that as you saying yes. Right. So, the word summons. Well, it kind of gives you the impression that uh, you know, you, you're, you're forced to appear somewhere. You're obliged to appear somewhere. The word summons means invitation. You're being invited to uh, appear at a private corporation's place of business uh, for one of their summary judgment services. That's, all, that's what it is. The word must also gives you the impression that uh, there's an obligation on you. The word must is synonymous with the word may. So when it says you must do something, well, you may do something. Very tricky. Uh, the word understand, you already know. Um, to stand under, to consent to. The next one includes, that's a very tricky one, okay? When you look in a legal dictionary, you look in Black's Law Dictionary, uh, you won't find the regular sort of uh, term and definition. All you find under includes is a bit of Latin. Inclusio unium est exclusio ulterius. Oh, I did that really smoothly, didn't I? Sound like. Yeah. I know that. <laughs> Well, what that means is the inclusion of one is the exclusion of others. So, let's imagine you get um, a diktat from the government that says everyone must pay £5,000, including homeless people. Well, in your mind, you think, well, everyone's got to pay this, uh, including those homeless people who think they're, they're, they're exempt. No, it means only homeless people have to pay it. The inclusion of one is exclusion of others. Yeah? Very tricky. Because it sets up a different um, idea in your mind. That's what it's meant to do. The word requirement. Yeah? It means request. So if it's a legal requirement, it's a legal request. And a request is something you can politely decline. <laughs> the word apply means to beg. So when you make a, a submit an application for registration, well the word submit means to bend to somebody else's will. Right, so you're bending to somebody else's will and begging them to take your stuff. That's what it is. So here's a couple more than legally words that uh, well they're kind of pressing and right now. The word mandate. So I'm going to read this. A mandate is a written command given by a principal to an agent, specifically a commission or contract by which one person, the mandator, requests someone, the mandatory, to perform some service gratuitously, for free, voluntarily. The commission becomes effective when the mandatory agrees. So something that's mandatory 
is voluntary. And it becomes mandatory as soon as you agree to it. That's what the word means legally. The word compulsory, or the first word, mandated, so I mean like this is the place, mandated by legal process or by statute. What does the, what's the power of a statute? It gets the force of law by your consent. So both of these mean voluntary. It's all word magic, because a lot of people are going to hear the words mandatory and compulsory and think, I've got to do it. It goes back to, there's a bit of psychology. Um, if you go to a shop and try and return some clothing and you don't have the receipt, a bond on the desk is going to go, sorry, you can't do that. Nine out of ten people are going to turn around and go, okay, I'm going home. But there's going to be one person who will stand and say, get the manager out here. Manager comes out and says, uh, you know what, I'm going to do it for you just this once. The point is, he has to do it. It's, a, it's the law. He has to return, let you return the clothes without the receipt. But it makes good business sense for him to put that authority figure on the desk to lie to people because nine out of ten people are just going to accept the lie without question. Okay? So when people hear these words, nine out of ten people are going to accept it without question. Okay? The government says I have to, so I have to. Right? So all the psychology. And you're going to find that this world is awash in this legalese type language. So we're going to have a quick look at contracts. Um, these are important because uh, what you'll find is you'll, you end up in, um, embroiled in contracts without knowing it. Right? The contracts are everywhere and most of the time they're hidden ones and you just end up in one without, without even thinking about it. So there are four elements to a contract. Okay? And all of these elements must be in place, otherwise the contract is null and void. Okay? And you'll find that every single one of the contracts you find yourself in, they're all null and void. So, I also remember these four items by the uh, acronym FLEM. So, <laughs> so, first of all, full disclosure. Uh, the terms and conditions of that contract must be fully disclosed and included within the body of the contract. So, the contract you sign, it's got to have all the terms and conditions on it. Well, one of the contracts, uh, I'll, um, we'll get into it in a little while, uh, the driving license is a contract. Okay? But it's not, it doesn't give you full disclosure because the terms and conditions of that driving license are in the Road Traffic Act, not on the document you sign. Okay? So it fails on that one. Next one is lawful terms and conditions. The terms and conditions must be lawful. Any element of fraud in a contract makes it null and void. Okay? So um, you know, the terms and conditions uh, essentially are you giving up a natural, inalienable right for an easily benefit privilege. That's not lawful. Okay? Equal consideration. That means both sides have to put up something of equal value in the contract. Okay? Once again, you giving up an expansive right for a restrictive privilege, that's not equal. Okay? The last one is manifestation of intent. Your signature is manifestation of intent. It's saying, I'm signing this because this is my intention. Okay. Now, on a contract, there has to be two signatures for both parties. Right. Again, most of the uh, contracts you find yourself in will only have your signature on. Okay. As I said, every contract has to have all of these in place, otherwise it's unenforceable. So, four ways you can agree to a contract. The uh, most notable one is a written contract. And as I said, most of these contracts are hidden ones that you don't know you're entering into. And I, did, I gave you the, the example of a driving license because um, most people think the driving license is a certificate of competency where the grumpy guy with the clipboard bashing your dashboard right, is saying, well I've just, I've just uh, watched this guy and he's a good driver so I'm going to say he's passed. But that driving instructor does not sign your driving license, does he? No, he doesn't. Who signs it? You do. 
So it's not a certificate of competency, it's a contract. It's a contract waiving your natural right to travel any way you see fit for the benefit privilege of being something called a driver. Okay? And all the rules and regulations and taxes and fees that goes along with it. Right? So, as I said, your signature is powerful. Your signature is very powerful. And we give that signature away in that drop of a hat. Imagine, you go to a, you go to a, a, a bank, right? You can, you can go to that bank and walk away with, a, with £100,000. What do they take from you? Your signature. Your signature. It's that powerful. Um, I'm, I've got a lot to get through, so I'm, I don't think I can answer the questions until... Do you actually know people Yeah, there's whole class of people who don't have a driving license and don't get hassled. They call them travellers. <laughs> that was true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah. Your things are very powerful and it's, it's a, of unlimited value. So be careful. You know, if somebody's asking you to sign something, be wary. Because again, your signature is worth a lot. Okay? And you don't know what you're giving away when you sign something. So always read and dissect the contract before signing it. Okay? Now when I came back to this country in 2010, um, I had to open a bank account. So uh, um, the bank said to me, here's an application form, just sign it. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's kind of it. Just, he said, just sign here and we'll open the account for you. So I said, um, you know what, I'm going to take this home. I'm going, to read for, I'm, going to, I'm going to come back in the morning. So I took it home, read through it, and I found a couple of charges I didn't like. So I crossed them out. And I put my initials after them. Okay? Did that twice. If I'd been a bit more savvy, I could have written in what I wanted in that contract and then put my initials. So when I signed it, I folded it back up, and I went back into the bank the next morning. And just as I expected me to sign it without reading it, they accepted it without reading. <laughs> so a few months later, I, uh, my, my bank balance dipped below zero for a microsecond, and I went, ah, oh, 30 pound charge. I said, I'm not paying it. Oh, you have to. Oh, no, I don't, it's not in our contract. Oh, yes, it is. Go and check. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, I got a letter saying, oh, we're going to remove that charge. Because you have power in a contract. You have just as much power in a contract as in a party. Okay? They haven't taught us this at school, that you have power in contracts. Okay? You can do exactly the same thing. What's supposed to happen is that I cross those things out, they read through it and go, oh, it doesn't like the £30 charge. What about £15? Oh, yeah, I'd be better if it's £10. Uh, okay, done. And then we've agreed, now we sign, now it's a, now it's a contract. Yeah? Uh, obviously, it doesn't go that way. And uh, these days, they're trying to put everything online, so your only option is tick a box and press OK. Yeah? Because they're trying to remove that power from you. Okay? There's also something called the Four Corners Rule. Anybody heard of the Four Corners Rule? No. Ah, well, the Four Corners Rule. Sorry? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, don't give it away. <laughs> I just want to know if you knew it. Yeah. Okay, so the Four Corners Rule. So again, very sneaky. Anything that is, appears in a box in, on that document is not part of the document. You can ignore it. Literally. So if it's in a box, or sometimes they just put the corners. I don't know if you've seen that, just put the corners. Yeah. If it's in four corners, it's not part of the document. You can ignore it and read the document without it. And you can bet that whatever's in that box is going to colour what's in the rest of the document in your mind. Okay? It's very tricky. Again, it's all about deception. Um, but once you sign a document, right, once you sign a contract, now it becomes law. It's, it's you agreed to something, and now it comes a do all you say you will do. Right? So, protecting your signature. As I said, your signature is very valuable. So if you're being forced to sign something. So let's say you're on the side of the road and the police have stopped you 
And for some reason they're saying, well, you've got to sign this. Otherwise we're going to arrest you or we're going to keep you here or whatever. Yeah? And you're forced to sign something. Well, write the words under duress as part of your signature. Yeah? Sometimes they might say, oh, that's not your signature. Well, how do you know? Yeah? The words under duress means that you'll be forced to sign, which means that signature is null and void. So it's as though you've not signed it. Okay? Can't, you, know, you can't be held against you in a court of law or anywhere because you were forced to sign it. Okay? Um, as a, again, as a, as a kind of rule, if you're signing any document, you might want to put the words without prejudice as part of your signature. Without prejudice basically means, um, and I'll read this out, I reserve my right not to be compelled to perform under any contract or commercial agreement, but I do not enter that knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally, and I do not accept the liability of the compelled benefit of any contract or commercial agreement not revealed to myself, which are my rights to pursue to common law. So basically you're saying, uh, if there's any bullshit attached to this, I'm not being held to it, essentially. Um, so you're, you're reserving your common law rights. And you can do that just by writing without prejudice on it. Okay? Um, so the second way to agree is a verbal contract. Okay? And the way that most people enter into a verbal contract is by answering questions. So um, when I said to David, would, would you like me to punch you in the face? Right, so now we have a verbal contract, which is, which is, a, which, which, which means we made this contract and after we leave here I can still punch you in the face because it's a reprieve. Without prejudice. <laughs> Without prejudice. Um, yeah, so, so with him answering yes to that question, we've, we've now got a verbal contract between us. And now I can do whatever I like within the terms of that contract. Um, so, uh, uh, oh yeah, do you understand? Yeah, again, that if, uh, if you say yes to that to a policeman, well now you've got a verbal contract and now yeah, you've consented to things. Um, so the way to get around that is to answer questions with questions. Yeah, it's a very sneaky trick really, because when they ask you a question, if you ask one back, now you've, uh, you've batted the ball back into their court. Yes, exactly. This is why they do it, yeah? They don't get pinned down or anything because they're always asking you the question back. So that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't sort of, the buck doesn't stop with them, yeah? So it's a, it's a very difficult game to play, yeah? But if you get it right, it's really very powerful, yeah? But you can be caught out. It can be easily caught out. Um, and it's no accident that they're, they're playing that on a, on a tennis court because that's the game. Return the ball. Yeah? If you make a statement, you fumble the ball. Yeah? You lose a point. Okay? So, yeah, very powerful, but again, it's a, it's a tricky skill to master. When I gave this talk, I gave a version of this talk to uh, uh, homeschoolers, uh, uh, 9 to, to 14 year olds. And uh, after we finished that lesson, they're all out in the garden going, uh, I'm not obliged to do that. Yes, you are. I'm doing a plain question, so it's really great to see. So they picked it up straight away. So the, the uh, third way to agree is consent implied by your actions. Okay, so answering a uh, stranger's questions is giving them authority to ask you or demand answers from you and expect you to give you an answer to them. Okay. So it's like a stranger coming up to you and saying, um, what are your bank details? So what were you saying? You'd say, well, who are you? Yeah, I, I thought you said something rude. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's a stranger asking you questions and you answering them is literally giving your authority away to that stranger. Right? If a policeman says, don't stand over there, and you just march over there, well, now you've given the policeman authority over you to demand or, or command you to do things and expect you're going to follow his commands. As soon as you follow his commands, he's got authority over you. Yeah? Consent implied by your actions. 
So um, well, one way to get around that is, am I obliged to stand over there, officer? Now the ball's in his court. Okay. Um, another way is, uh, is that an order or is that a request? Well, if it's a request, then, um, you know, you can politely decline the request. But if it's an order, well, orders are chargeable. Okay? So what happens if you go to McDonald's and you order a cheeseburger? What comes next? You pay. Who sets the price? McDonald's does. So if somebody orders you to do something, right? Charge them. You know, you don't work for free, do you? Well, no, if somebody orders you to do something, right, you can charge them and you set the price. So, like if you go to McDonald's and you say, I'd like a cheeseburger, please. Oh, cheeseburger's 25 quid. Do you still want a cheeseburger? Now it's down to you. Do you want a cheeseburger? It's going to cost you 25 quid. The choice is yours. So, um, there's a video on my channel uh, where I get stopped by the police. And uh, the policeman wants me to get out of the car. So I say, um, so to him, well, I'm happy to get out of the car, officer, but I don't work for free. If you want me to get out of the car, it's going to cost you £20,000. Do you still want me to get out of the car? He said, yes. I said, hold on a sec. And I wrote out an invoice. <laughs> and he signed it on camera. So now, right, and then, then I got out of the car. But now, I mean, I, I didn't do this, and uh, maybe I'll get into it why a little later. But um, now I can go to uh, I can go to court and go. A million people have watched me because a million people have watched this video man, right now. Many people have watched me make this man an offer. He accepted the offer. I performed. He hasn't paid. Open a shut case. Did not a leg to stand on. Um, I, I didn't do that. <laughs> um, and because uh, the other thing I was going to do was uh, uh, I was going to get a, what's known as a commercial lien on Hampshire Police, which meant that I could, even when I get it um, uh, matured, I could uh, go to Hampshire and get goods to the value of. And I set my lien at £50,000. But I didn't do it. But if I was going to do that, what I was going to, I was going to do was um, go to Hampshire and start clamping police cars. <laughs> And I had a friend with a removals company. He was going to go and collect those clamp cars and line them up outside my house so I can, on my YouTube video, go. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if I did that and um, took the uh, coppers to call, I'd have every single policeman in the country after me. So there were other things I needed to do, so I, I let it go. <laughs> um, but anyway, the point is that uh, um, as I said, you can charge, if somebody's ordering to, you to do something, you can charge them and you can set the price for it. Yeah? Um, so even if you, if you uh, write your documents to whoever, make sure you have a fee schedule for your, your time, your, your effort and, and your expenses. Or anything you can think of. Inconvenience fee, you know? <laughs> anything you can think of. But uh, your, your time is valuable and anyone expecting you to service an order for free, well that's blackmail, that's fraud, that's, that's business malpractice. Okay. Um, so there's something called, a, you know, still on the topic of uh, consent implied by your actions, there's a type of contract called an adhesion contract. Now you might be familiar with it when you go and park your car in a car park. Okay. Somewhere in that car park, it says notice. By parking in this car park, you agree to the following fees. And then they lay out their fee schedule. Okay? And that contract is deemed to be activated as soon as you park your car in that car park. So consent implied by your actions. Okay? Well, the way you can get out of that is you put your own notice on your car. Okay? And this is, this is a notice that's in my car right now. Okay? It says, um, and I'll, I'll summarise, it says it's, um, it's to, uh, this is to anyone who's a DVLA police or parking attendants, whatever. It's in the that. It says, you agree to pay £250 for each notice that is attached or issued to this car. You agree to pay £125 
for each image or photograph that you take in this car. You agree, well, sorry, if you collect this car, you agree to pay £500 per hour or portion of thereof until the tax is removed. If you move, relo relocate, or tow this car, you thereby agree to pay £750 per hour. Okay? So you're using um, the power they're using against you, you're using against them. Sorry? Oh yes, <laughs> yes. I had this car. I had this in my car for a good couple of years. One time, I parked. Uh, me and my friends went to a party. I parked in this in the street, and uh, it, we didn't know it was residents only. Came out in the morning. Uh, um, tickets on all the cars except mine. And there was one time that they did actually put a parking ticket in my car, and it was for fifty quid. So I wrote back to him and said, um, uh, thank you for your parking charge. Um, I, your parking attendant would have noticed that I had a notice in my window. Um, my charges for, for your, your notice are £250. Send me the £250 and I'll send you your £50 back. I never heard from them again. So, so yes, um, I, I didn't bring my car today, but I would have said it was outside. It's in my window at the moment. And uh, yeah, people have noticed it as well. People have noticed it and come up and say, oh, I just noticed your window, it's brilliant, you know. But it works, yeah. So um, hopefully if I, if I put out the, uh, the slides for this, you'll, you'll be able to get it. Yes, yes, please. Have you deregistered your car? No, I didn't. Uh, you don't have to deregister your car to do that. What you're doing there is, is, is playing them at their own game, yeah. The power they have to make an adhesion contract is the same power you have to make an adhesion contract. Yeah? Plus these, these companies, they're all businesses. They're all businesses doing business with you, so you can do business with them. You've got exactly the same power as they have, so use it. Yeah? So um, the fourth way to agree okay, is, is called tacit acquiescence. That means agreement by your silence. You have the right to remain silent, okay? But if somebody makes you an offer and you remain silent, then that, that offer is deemed to be accepted, okay? He who is silent consents. That's the maximum law. Um, so you find that uh, judges use this trick all the time, okay? When you go to, when you go to court and the judge makes a, a pronouncement like, I'm going to fine you 500 pounds. Right? He will he will pause, and he will try and cover up that pause by uh, shuffling paper or, or looking around for somebody in the court or something. But he's giving you a pause, and in that pause you're supposed to object. And if you don't object in that narrow window he gives you, well then you've accepted that uh, pronouncement. Your silence means consent. Now there's a woman who went to court, and uh, that happened to her. The judge said, uh, "Well, I'm going to get I'm going to find you five hundred pounds." And immediately she said, I'm not going to pay that. I'm not going to do it. And the judge leaned forward and said, well, what about £250? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's an offer, okay? And, uh, and she didn't accept it. Uh, governments use that as well. Use this trick as well. So when they make, uh, made like a uh, mask, when they said the mask mandate on public transport, they always said, or what they always say, um, okay, from the 25th of March, there's going to be a mask mandate. They don't say, oh right, from today, there's you know, masks, we've got to wear masks. No, they always put it in the future. And that time is your moment to, to object. And if you don't object, right on, you want the mask mandate then, and they bring it in. Okay? But they always give you that time to object. And if you remain silent, then it's deemed that you've accepted it. Okay. They also used to do it with council tax. Every year, around about March, they put like a double page spread in the local paper. This is what we're going to do with your council tax. It's an offer. Do you, do you want to pay council tax so we can do this with it? And if nobody objects, then okay, righty home. We're going to get council tax. So yeah, this is the four ways you can agree to contracts. As, as I said, contracts are everywhere, and half the time you don't know you're getting into them. Right, so uh, what time is that? 
I don't know, hurry up. Okay, so I'm going to whiz through this one. Driving and travelling, okay? Um, as I said, uh, I've said this before actually, um, the driver has a contract and we won't have right to travel for the benefit privilege of being a, a driver. So the driving license fails on all four title uh, elements of the contract. So the driving license isn't enforceable. Um, and one of the things you do in the common law um, is you dissect the English grammar because we've never been taught grammar properly. Okay? So the Road Traffic Act defines a motor vehicle as a mechanically propelled vehicle, right, and acting or intended for use on the road. What it is it uses, well first of all, a motor vehicle and a vehicle are two different things. Because in the definition of motor vehicle, it says vehicle. So they're two different things. But this definition uses the indefinite article puppy, meaning that a motor vehicle is only one type of mechanically propelled vehicle. I hope you're following me with this. Yeah. So let's define an apple as a round red fruit. So are these apples? No, they're not. It means an apple is just one type of round red fruit. Yeah? So, not all of these mechanically propelled vehicles are motor vehicles. So let's see what is a motor vehicle. So this is the legal definition of a motor vehicle. And this is how you've got to use Black's Law Dictionary and this is how tricky they make it. Okay, so again, it's defined, a motor vehicle is defined as a mechanically propelled vehicle that actually were intended to use on our own. Or what's a vehicle? Includes every description of carriage or other artificial contrivance used or capable of being uh, capable of being used as a means of transportation or land. Well, what's a carriage? Carriage, a vehicle used for transportation of persons, either for pleasure or business. Transportation, what's that? The removal of goods or persons from one place to another by a carrier. Hmm, what's a carrier? Carrier, one who undertakes to transport persons or property from place to place by means of conveyance and with or without compensation. It's starting to sound a bit commercial, isn't it? Yeah. So what's an undertaking? A promise, an engagement, or stipulation, each of the promises made by parties to a contract. Hmm. So, what's the most vehicle? It's every description of mechanically propelled artificial contrivance, adapted or intended for use on the road, used or capable of being used as a means of removing goods and plastic goods or persons from one place to another by one who, is in, who has promised, contracted, or been engaged to tra transport persons or property from place to place with or without compensation. So that means a taxi driver is a driver. A bus driver is a, bus, is a driver. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So a bus is a motor vehicle because it's, it fits that definition. A taxi is a vehicle because it fits that definition. Yeah? Your car, when you're getting it to go to Tesco's, does it fit that definition? No, it doesn't. Your car is not a motor vehicle. Okay? Just like a butter knife is not a deadly weapon. Okay? It's a butter knife. But if I were to grab that butter knife and stab somebody in the eye with it, now it's a deadly weapon. It's how it's being used that defines what it is. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, what's the driver? Okay. One who is employed to conduct or operate a carriage. Okay. The matter. A lessee or a person who hires the services of another, a hirer, a person hired to make specific work. What's the conductor? A person who engages to perform the piece of work for another at a stated price. Operative, a workman, a labouring man. So to drive means to commercially operate a vehicle used for transporting passengers or property for hire. So again, a taxi driver is a driver, a bus driver is a driver, a coach driver is a driver, a lorry driver is a driver. But are you a driver? No, you're not. And this is how they, they trigger us. By, um, we, we, we all use the word, well, yes, we're, we're driving down the shops. Right? We're not. We're just travelling. Literally travelling. 
as soon as you admit to being a driver, now you become one of these straw men, one of these legal fictions. Okay? So, uh, you can't read this, but this is a, um, a Freedom of Information request that went out to the DVLA. And it says, and I know you can't read it here, but it says, I acknowledge that the common law right to travel still exists. Full stop. Okay? The rest of this is bullshit word magic to make you believe that you still need a tax, you need tax, MOT, insurance, and all that. You know, it talks about vehicles and drivers. So we're not talking about drivers, we're talking about the right to travel. Okay? But they always use this word magic to try and steer you back to their way of thinking. And as I said, there are a group of people who already know all this and they don't buy into all this bullshit. And it's travellers. They don't have tax, MOT, insurance or driving licences. But the police don't touch them because they know they're travelling. We don't. So just a final thing on this topic. This is, a, again, a letter that's sent to uh, an MP. And it says, thank you for contacting me about driving licences. There is no legal requirement for a driving licence in the United Kingdom. Right there, from the horse's mouth. So I'm going to quickly, uh, quicker, quicker, quicker. Um, move on to uh, the police force. First thing to know about the police force is they're a company. They're a registered company doing business for profit. They make profit from every time they fine you, every time you go to prison, every time you know they do any action on you, they get money. Okay? And uh, yeah, I've just got Essex Police in there and, uh, and I've got all the, all the branches. I think I found uh, the one in Basildon is one of the branches of the headquarters that are in Chelmsford. Okay? So, as I said before, we used to have constables who were there to serve and protect us and uphold the common law. And very, very slowly they got morphed into these police officers, yeah, enforcing statutes illegally. But the thing is, underneath this guy's uniform is this guy. Because they all swear the same constable's oath. <coughs> and this is the constable's oath. And it says things like uh, upholding fundamental human rights and prevent all offences against people and property. It's these guys that are just like it, that are causing all these offences against people and their property. Yeah. So here's a gang of uh, six police officers honouring their common oath to serve and protect. Now, when it loops around again, watch the other woman in this and watch what she's doing. Watch what she's doing. She's grabbing the crutch out of the guy's hands. It was like. This is, um, you know, this, I don't think this is in this country, this is some other country, but it doesn't matter because we're seeing this everywhere now. If you've been to a protest, what you'll see is uh, a couple of guys beating up somebody in the middle and you've got a ring of policemen going, stay back, stay back. Yeah? I can't watch this too much anyway. Unless you're chucking a statue in the river. Yeah. Unless you're doing something that the system likes. So the thing about the police is that they have the same powers and duties that you have, okay? You have the power of arrest. Just because you, they call it citizen's arrest doesn't make it any different from what the police can do, okay? And also you have a duty as a sovereign being that if there is a crime being committed right in front of you, it is your duty to do to the best of your ability to go and stop that crime. Okay, that is our duty. The only difference between us and the police is that we pay them to do that full time. Okay? No difference. Um, they haven't got any power over you unless you commit a crime, of course. I should put that before any of all of these. Before you, unless you've committed a crime, they've got no power over you whatsoever. That's all at all at all. Yeah? Um, they have no jurisdiction over civil matters. Okay, so anything that isn't a crime, they've got no jurisdiction over. They can't do anything about. Okay. Referring to a crime in law or law and or common law. Well, law is common law. So a crime again requires an injured party. 
there's no injured party, there's no crime. Yeah? If there's no crime, police can't get involved. They do get involved. Why, why they, do they get involved? Because all of us believe they can. Well, not all of us, the, the muggles out there who watch television. Right? There's a reason why there's so many crime and, TV and police shows on TV. So that you believe that they can do all sorts of things they actually can't. Yeah. Yeah? So the only reason they, they think they can is because the uh, public opinion believes that they can. Yeah? So um, in order to do anything to you, they need to identify you first. If you commit a crime, they don't need to identify you. They could just grab you and haul you off. But if, uh, if it's a civil matter, well, they need to identify you to make you the same as one of those legal fictions. Now they can have power over you. And for that, to identify you, they need, they need your name, date of birth, and address. Okay. So, um, when you start talking to a copper, they, 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 don't, really, um, they don't want to be your friend. Okay. They, they don't care really you know, if, whether you're having a nice day or not. Yeah. They're trying to get authority over you. They're trying to, um, to get you to confess to something. They're trying to get you to argue. Because it's a place for arguments, they call that court. Yeah? They're trying to, they're trying to um, uh, actually fill their quota, because they're on a quota system. Yeah? They've got to have so many arrests and interactions, um, otherwise they, you know, their jobs are in peril. So if they arrest you, best thing to do, again, if they arrest you and you haven't committed a crime, well, they're trying to get you on a civil matter, which they can't do. So the best thing you can do is remain silent. Don't say anything. I mean, the most they can do is hold you for 24 hours, 23 hours and 59 minutes. Yeah? Um, because arrest without charge, which is what you'll end up um, being in, so if uh, you got pulled away on, um, during a protest, the likelihood is you, you get released without charge. Well, arrest without charge is assault and false imprisonment. Okay? You can go after them for that. Yeah? including this thing called misconduct in public office, which has teeth, because it gives a, a, the, the sentence is a life sentence for anyone who breaks that. Okay? Got real teeth. So do you need to give your details? No, you don't. When, uh, remember, if you haven't committed a crime, no power over you whatsoever. Yeah? Again, yeah, they're trying to get information, they're trying to identify you so they can do something to you. Right? So um, you have the right to remain silent. Okay? So if they try and arrest you for not giving your details, what's the first line of, uh, of the police caution? Does anyone remember? So in other words, you have the right to remain silent. So how can you be arrested for exercising your right to remain silent if the, words, the first words of the arrest are, you've got the right to remain silent. <laughs> it's a nonsense. Yeah? But unless you, you point that out to them, right, well, they'll just go ahead and, and, and arrest you for it. Okay? Um, right, so they have a phone chart they have to follow. Right? So um, it's the four E's. Engage, explain, um, sorry, engage, explain, encourage, and enforce. Now, they can't jump straight to enforce. I have to go through each step. Okay? So, um, hello sir, how are you today? Good, thank you. Wow, you take off, engage. Right? I've engaged with it. Okay? Well, I'm here to tell you about uh, the Coronavirus Act. You're not allowed to be in a place with more than two people. Well, you don't even have to answer or say anything, because now I've explained to you. Yeah? Well, I suggest you, uh, you go home now, because otherwise I'll, I might be forced to, to arrest you. Now, I've encouraged you. Now, if you don't go, now I can jump to, you know, enforce. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, so, um, I've got a little video here. I'm not going to, uh, I guess I have to preface it a bit. I went to a, a sand in the park um, one day, and uh, um, I went into a cafe that's on the park. And I didn't have a mask on, I had a little altercation, nothing, you know, my was just a back and forth um, chat. And, uh, you know, I refused to, to, to go for a little while. But eventually I said to me, okay, I'll leave you to it. And I went back and I sat on the grass. 
a few minutes later, the police turned up because he had really called the police on me. And four policemen came out. So they didn't just want to chat to me, they were after an arrest because they don't send four people out just to just have a chat. Okay? So um, it's a bit noisy to start with, but um, after it calms down a little bit, you'll hear what I'm saying to the police officers. So, I'm sitting on the grass here. You're on here looking for a while. Facebook as well, uh, police departments um, proudly saying how they've 
seize somebody's car because they've not paid tax and stuff like that. Okay? Um, they can't do it. I, um, I sent a freedom of information request to Greater Manchester Police saying, um, asking them, what is the lawful basis of your seizures? They sent me um, a whole stack of legislation to look at. It took me three days to look for it. And what I found out was they have no lawful basis of seizing, of seizing property. What they do is they convince you that they have the, the uh, power to do that. They get you out of the car, and once you're out of the car, they'll say, OK, we can take you wherever you want to go, to the station, to give you a travel document or whatever, get the hell out of here. And then they come back to the car and go, oh, look, an abandoned car. We'll move that for safety. And then they salvage that car. That's it. It's the law of the sea. Um, can you be detained by police? Well, no, they can't lawfully detain you at all. Um, so detention is false imprisonment. Yeah? And even a threat of arrest is assault. Uh, if they seize you, or they say, we're going to arrest you, and they seize you and grab you, that's battery. So if they threaten to arrest you and seize you, that's assault and battery. Um, and so the best way around it is to put them into a double bind. Okay? Am I under arrest? Well, no, you're not. Oh, that means I'm free to go, yeah? No, you're not. Oh, so I must be under arrest. Uh, no, you're not. Oh, so I'm free to go, am I? No, you're not. Oh, so I must be under arrest. <laughs> so eventually you get bored and I'll let you go. Um, so dealing with police. First of all, don't be intimidated by TV shows. As I said, that's what they're there for. So make you intimidated. Yeah? Don't be intimidated by the uniform. The uniform is designed to make you afraid. Yeah? Um, the blue lights are there to make you afraid. Yeah? I don't, don't care how brave you are, how much knowledge you have, if you're driving and you see those blue lights behind you, you get a stab of fear. Is it me? What have I done? Yeah? Same thing when two of these fluorescent idiots come towards you, you know, all glowing. Yeah? You go, you, the first thought is, are they coming for me? What have I done? Yeah? It's designed to, to put you out and sort of uh, off, off your game, essentially. Um, so again, remember, if you're not committed by them, they've got no power over you. They need something called reasonable, articulable suspicion. If they want to search you, for instance, they need a reasonable reason. They can't say, well, I don't like the way you look, or I don't think you should be here. You know? It's not reasonable. They have to have a reasonable suspicion. They have to be able to articulate it properly. Um, yeah, they, they need you to give them authority, um, your authority. They need you to answer their questions. They need you to argue. They need you to confess. If you don't do any of that, they, they've got nothing. Okay? Um, yeah, Rice right, versus Connolly is a good way. Uh, say I don't answer questions, yes, yeah, a good way, but what they'll do is they'll continue to answer and ask you questions and eventually you'll slip up and then you've invalidated what you said earlier on. So, yeah, you've got to be very wary. Okay? Um, so, best not say anything at all to police. But if you do, stay calm but assertive. In this country, we're taught to be. Um, oh, what is, what's the word? Polite, uh, subserviently polite. Subserviently polite. So people um, start conversations with, uh, sorry, or excuse me, you know. Um, I'm, I'm teaching, I teach peace constables, and uh, when we do the role plays, uh, the, you know, there's a policeman talking to a victim, and somehow the, the peace constables got involved, and they often go, um, sorry, or uh, excuse me. Yeah, that, that's being subservient. That's giving power away to whoever you're talking to. And so you've got to learn to be calm yet assertive. So this is what um, asserting yourself looks like.
do I DV have to show you proof that I bought that bike? Ask the question. Would you like me to answer it for you? The answer is no, I don't. So I'm going to say to you again, I bought the bike, it's going to stay in my car until I decide to take it out. Now you know when we're required. Goodbye. <laughs> Their lookout. 
But um, again, if you don't want that confrontation, you know, being uh, having the police call to say you've stolen, why don't you just leave the money on the, on the side? So how does, it, how does it stand if they've got it on their window or their door? We do not accept cash, and you go in. So okay, it's still so it's still legal, still okay. legal tender. They're supposed to accept it just because they had changed their policy. Yeah, it's the same with the mask mandates. When they when Morrison's changed their policy, well, that goes against the law. Yeah, that good policy doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Um, when they do lockdowns, well, you have a document from the Queen, a permit from the Queen that says you can go wherever you want. Yeah. <laughs> on that page, on the front page, it says, uh, Britannic Majesty Secretary, Secretary of State requests and requires in the name of Her Majesty to all those, to all those who may concern to allow the bearer to pass freely without let or hindrance and afford the bearer such assistance and protection as may be necessary. Does he say anything about uh, uh, ports or different countries? No, it doesn't. It's a letter from the Queen to their, her employees to let you go, to leave you alone. And people have used that successfully. Um, so when I said employees, employees are talking about uh, you, you have to have the jab, otherwise you'll lose your job. Well, um, well, contract employment doesn't specify that your, your employer can force you to undergo a medical intervention yeah, on demand. It doesn't say that in your contract. Yeah? Um, your employer cannot unilaterally, unilaterally change your contract. You need to sign off on it. Okay? And sometimes what they do is they sack you and then take you on under another contract and I'll put that in there. But until they do that, you're working on a, on a contract. Okay? And if they sack you on the basis that you didn't take a, a vaccine and it's not in your contract, well then you can sue them for breach of contract. Okay? So again, they make these mandates, mandates, yeah, and uh, most nine out of ten people go, okay then, does I have to? But you, you've got your protection right there, you've just forgotten you've got it. Um, also, the government are not a party to your contract. So the government can't impose anything on your contract because they're not a party to it. Um, so yeah, if they impose a uh, vaccine mandate, that renders them liable to breach contract. Um, so, as I said, most people know already that force of coerced mandated vaccin vaccinations are a violation of the Nuremberg Code. Um, and this came out just recently, a Hammersmith police confirmed to, confirmed to a, a group of lawyers and uh, Mark Sexton, who's an ex-policeman, that anyone sacked or been threatened with a sack in order to coerce them into taking a jab is a victim of blackmail. So it's been confirmed by the police now. So don't quit. If you're under threat of uh, losing your job over not taking a vaccine, don't quit. Let them sack you. And then come after, go after them, and uh, you know you'll win that case. Okay, you, you get. Sorry. Is that why IKEA has refused to give sick pay to those locked out? They're getting around it. They're trying. Yeah, they're trying all sorts of ways to get around it. But this, this actually just underlines the point that they're actually in, in deep trouble by trying to uh, force people to, to get this chat. So they'll be sort of wriggling around it, you know. Um, so, there's also this, this is a, a notice of conditional acceptance. Uh, now, I wrote, I wrote a book back in 2014, and the section on vaccines, I had this, uh, this notice. So this came straight out of my book, and I just added to it. So, conditional acceptance is basically saying, I'm happy to accept the jab, on condition that you supply me with the following information. And you just ask, Several questions, I've got mine there, that they should be able to give you in all good conscience. They should be able to give you the answers in all good conscience, but they can't because they don't exist. So it leaves you in a stalemate position where you said, I'm, I'm happy to accept it, but the ball's in your court. You just give me this information, such as proof that the legal status of the vaccine is not experimental. They can't prove that, right? Because it is, right? Uh, 
least one double blind for CMO control study that proves the safety and effectiveness of vaccines. <coughs> well, they should be able to give you that, shouldn't they? But they can't because it doesn't exist. So you've got all these questions that do exactly the same thing. Yeah? Uh, they should be able to give, you, give it these, these answers to you in all good conscience, but they can't because there's no such thing. Okay? These are in a, double, uh, in, in a, uh, a stalemate position where they can't proceed because you know, they need to give you these answers first and uh, you've already accepted, so you can't be taken to court or anything because you've accepted it. Along with this comes a liability statement that you get and you say, well, I also need you, this is a long, uh, yeah, I also need, you're required to re return the enclosed liability statement. And that liability statement is saying that I, whoever is wanting um, to give you the jab, um, uh, in this case he's a doctor, um, I'll be seven patient and the patient does not have food, any of the following conditions, and there's all the conditions that you're likely to get if you get the jab. I therefore accept full responsibility and full commercial liability should the patient experience anaphylactic shock, autoimmunity issues, or subsequently be diagnosed with any of the above conditions as a result of receiving, receiving this vaccine. Nobody is going to sign that. Nobody is going to take responsibility for their actions. Right? Again, it leaves you in a stalemate position. And then, you know, um, you can't or they can't proceed. So, um, I'm, I'm aware of this time. How much time have I got? Two hours. Two hours. Twenty minutes. Oh, Twenty minutes as well. Oh, yeah. I might have to, I'm sorry, I might have to skip council tax. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's, the thing is, that, you know, this is part of the eight hour thing, and, uh, and you know, this is the one I have to skip if, uh, if I'm running out of time. So, sorry. I have to get you back for the, for the eight hour one, yeah? You're up and sick. <laughs> sorry, sorry about this, we're going to skip all the things. Oh, wow. Oh, 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 um, I find new information, I, I just chuck it in there and uh, I forget about the timing and stuff. So. Is it on your website? Uh, some of it is, but not all of it. Um, I don't have time. Did you say you're going to share this? Well, if, if uh, somebody wants to organise something, I'm, I'm happy to do. It's an eight hour one, yeah, all day, nine to five. Uh, there will be breaks, I'm not just talking to you for, for eight hours, but, but yes, it's, uh, I go through everything. and. Uh, you'll come away with knowing how to deal with all this stuff. Okay, so, I give some neck okay? Then yeah, I'm going to through this. Again, TV shows give you the illusion that they've got power. Okay, that's why they're there. And half the scenarios on these shows are, are crisis actors. They are pretending that they can do these things. Okay, they've got no power whatsoever unless you give it to them. Um, I mean, uh, just like a, a stranger coming up to you and saying, you owe me a tenner. Hang up. What would you say? I'd say, I'd love to be quite a sneak. Yeah, so, so you say, no, who the hell are you? I don't owe you anything. Yeah? But this is exactly what they, what they are. They, what they've done, I think I've got, uh, okay, I want to say that. Um, they also say they've got a warrant. They always say they've got a warrant, okay? Now, Warren has certain things that uh, you should look out for. One of them is a signature from a judge. And uh, these warrants don't ever have a signature on it because nobody wants to take responsibility for it. That's okay. to be a wet one. Yeah. That's to be a wet signature, yes. An actual signature. Also, it has to have a court seal. Now, this is a court seal. You will hardly ever, ever see a proper court seal. This is just a, a, a stamp, a rubber stamp. Okay. One that I saw had a fake version of a crown in it, and it just said the court on it. <laughs> <laughs> like I was going to be fooled by it. Yeah? So yeah, um, you will never ever see one of these because uh, um, courts hardly ever do these things. So um, when you're dealing with debt collector, they can only come in if you open the door to them. Because when you open the door to them, you're implying you're letting them in. By opening that door, you're just making that implication. 
and they're seizing on that implication. Okay, that's how they can stick their foot in the door. The uh, warrant that they say that they have, which is essentially a blank piece of paper, right? If they're saying it's uh, from a court, that makes them liable to the County Courts Act 1984, Section 135, falsely pretending to act under the authority of a court. That's seven years in prison. You tell them that, they hide that one very quickly. Yeah. Um, so the thing about these debt collectors, they have actually just bought your debt. They've gone to the bank and they've said, um, any outstanding uh, debts you've got? And I'll say, uh, I'm going to pick on you because you're right in front of me. Yeah, oh, there's Davey, he's, uh, he's uh, got a thousand pounds he's that he owes. And the debt collectors will go, okay, we'll buy that for a tenner. And he says, okay. So now the debt collector goes to David and say, says, oh, you better pay up or we're going to you know, threaten him and, and whatever. Because it's very lucrative. They've paid out a tenner and they potentially can get um, you know, 990 plus whatever fees they want to add to it as well for, for, for a tenner. Okay? So all they did was bought the debt. The, the thing about that is, because the bank accepted a tenner for a thousand, that means that debt's paid off. <laughs> so one of the things you can say is, thank you debt collectors for paying off my debt. You should have come to me first to see if I'd pay you back. But you didn't, so I'm not. Yeah? Because that's what they've done. They're not acting as agents for the bank or anything. They've just bought your debt from you. Or for, for, uh, from them. Um, so, yes, you don't have a contract with them. They're just a, a, a company that you don't know. Yeah, they've just come up and said, oh, you owe us money now. <laughs> okay? You don't. Um, they have no proof of agency. They're pretending that they're agents for the bank. They're not. They just bought the debt. Okay? So do not contract with them. So one of the things you can do is by your door, you can put a notice of removal of implied threat of access. As I said, when you open the door to them, you're implying you're letting them in. You can explicitly remove that information by this notice that you put by your door, or better still, on your front gate, so even before they get to the front door. Um, and this one says, I hereby, um, I hereby give notice that the entire right of access of the property known as whatever has been removed in respect of the following, and these are all the people that this applies to, bailiffs, police, whatever. Um, and you also give a, 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 a fee schedule saying that if you violate this, right, your, the fine is £10,000. Okay? Knocking on the door or pushing a bell button will be deemed to mean that you agree to the terms and conditions of that. <laughs> so it's uh, an adhesion contract. Take it or leave it. Yeah? Um, the other thing you can do is just put private by appointment only. Okay? Just put that on beside the front door. If they want to make an appointment, well, they cost £3,000. <laughs> if they want to make an appointment, you know? So again, they're companies doing business with you, so you can do business with them. Okay? So sometimes you get dead collectors being held by the police. Have you seen that? Yeah. yeah? So it turns out they're not allowed to do that. Yeah, debt, uh, police, uh, debt collection is a civil matter. Police can't get involved. So if you see police helping a debt collector, well now they're liable to Section 26 of the Criminal Justice and Courts Act. Abuse of position by a police constable causing another to suffer loss for the benefit of the third party. Yeah? So as soon as the police start helping the bailiff, you can say, hang on, that sounds like you're helping them. You know that makes you liable for, the, for, for this statute. They seem to back off. They have to, yeah? Because uh, it carries a 14 year prison sentence, which uh, again has teeth. So, um, this turns out to be the very first uh, left debt collector's letter that I ever sent. Because um, when I was first while trying to figure out how to do this common law stuff, this is the first thing I ever did. So, I had a debt for $39. So, I thought if, I go, if it goes horribly wrong, you know, I'll still be able to survive. <laughs> so, it's, just, it's very simple. It says, he says, I mean, I've received your account statement for such and such. I admit to being somewhat confused because I don't have any record of owning an account with you. 
and you can, I don't know who the hell you are. Yeah? This may be because of some error on my part, in which case I'd be happy to accept and discharge the 3990 that you claim I owe you. However, to, in order to verify this debt, please provide me with a copy of the lawful two party contract signed both by myself and a representative of GM Recovery Systems that forms the basis of the obligation to pay the now claim. Please deliver this verification within seven days. Otherwise, it will be, it will be, uh, sorry, failure to do so will comprise tacit proof that Shem Recovery Systems is unable to verify and validate the alleged debt. Saying, you know, prove to me there's a debt. If you can't, I'm off. And that's it. I never heard from them again. It's a very simple letter. That's my first one. It was a pretty crap letter, but it worked. <laughs> yeah? So, um, again, I'm rushing, rushing ahead. Um, dealing with banks, okay? So, when a bank lends money to you, where does the money come from? It comes from you. Yeah? Um, it's legal and painful. Yeah, you believe, you've been led to believe that banks have money. They don't. Okay? Banks create credit from your promise to pay. Right? So, when you, um, when you sign a, a loan agreement, right, on that loan agreement, it's got an amount, it's got a date which you're supposedly to pay it back, and now it's got your signature on it. So now you've created a promissory note. Look in, the, look in your wallet or your, your, you know, your back pocket. Those pieces of paper are promissory notes. That's why it says, I promise to pay the bearer. It's just a promissory note. And you have, um, this is like, well, you have the power to create your own ones. Okay, but when you sign a loan agreement, you create a promissory note, all the bank does is take that note and cash it, cashes it. They take that note and they go tap, 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 and now you apparently have £10,000 or whatever. But it's £10,000 of credit in their banking system. Yeah? It's not real. They gave you, they gave you nothing. Okay? It's just an, an illusion. Okay? Um, so the other thing they do is they take that, that loan agreement, which is now a valuable security, because it's now worth three times the face value with interest, okay? And they sell it on the securities market. So they've already sold that loan agreement. That loan agreement is the only evidence that there's a loan. So if you go back to them and say, um, can you show me the evidence that there's a loan between that, that I have to pay you? They can't, give, they can't give it to you. It's gone. <laughs> so, so there is no loan. Right? So um, the proof of it is in the Bank of England's quarterly bulletin. It says, banks extend credit by simply increasing the borrower's, borrowing customer's current account. That's it. That's how they create the money. They just type it in. That's it. And then you work your ass off for the next 10 years or something trying to pay it back. Trying to pay this back. Yeah? Banks extend credit by creating money. That's it. But there's a, a further swindle to this. When the bank creates money, they only create the principal. They don't create the, the interest. So let's uh, illustrate this. Imagine there's no money in the world. Okay? And I go to a bank and I borrow a thousand pounds. I spend that thousand pounds into the world. And now there's a pile of money in the world. Okay, a thousand pounds. But I owe, I owe the bank twelve hundred pounds with interest. Hang on, there's only one thousand pounds in the world. Where am I going to get that twelve hundred pounds from? Now let's imagine that Davies uh, also uh, borrowed a thousand pounds from the bank. And now he spends it into the world. Okay. Now there's two thousand pounds in the world. Now imagine I'm a very savvy businessman and I manage to get my £1,200 and I pay back my loan. Okay. Now how can David pay back his £1,200? Because there's only £800 left in the world. David's not going to be able to pay his, uh, his loan off. He's going to have his house taken from him. That's how the game is. Okay. It's a rigged game. Right. Um, it's like a game of musical chairs. Right? And it's so big that nobody can see it in operation. But 
Whenever anybody pays off their loan, somebody loses a share. And that's the real game, okay? And it's, you can see it in this game. It's a game that nobody ever finishes, okay? The reason nobody ever finishes it because we all think the game ends when the last person still, um, uh, still has money left. But that's not the end of the game. What would happen if that person carried on playing? What would happen? He will lose. The bank will end up with all the money. Yeah? The game is rigged, so the bank always wins. And that's the system we're in. The bank always wins. Okay? And it's illustrated in this game, but we don't see it because we never finish the game. Yeah? So here's a letter for, for the bank. If you've got a, a loan, okay? So, dear Mr. Thief, I'm currently performing an audit of my financial obligations. As I found I might be the victim of fraud and financial malfeasance, although I'm sure that such a reputable company as yours would not be an artist as such in its deeds, I nonetheless feel I must be rigorous in my investigation into this matter. I agree to settle any financial obligation I might offer you on condition that I receive the following documentation from you. Validation of thinking tanks, a valuable consideration pertaining to the alleged debt in the form of actual accounting of its losses. But the bank didn't lose anything. It literally just typed in a value into your bank account. It didn't lose a thing. So there is no accounting of losses. Okay? Verification of your claim against me in a sworn affidavit or hand signed invoice in accordance, in accordance with the Bill Exchange Act. Nobody is going to sign their name to this fraud. Okay? So they can't give that either. A copy of the contract signed by both parties therefore binding both parties. Whose signature appears on that loan agreement? Just yours. They did claim at one point, <laughs> um, they did claim that, you know when you go for a mortgage and you fill in that mortgage form, the lawyer goes, puts an X, you go sign here, here and here. Well they claim that that X was their signature. <laughs> so yeah, that's them trying to get out of it. But uh, they haven't got a copy of the contract with both signatures, so that contract is now void. Proof of claim that the funds advanced to myself were the thieving, were thieving bank's assets from the outset, and were neither created for the thieving bank by signature, promise, or promissory note, nor were they created upon the thieving bank's books by mere bookkeeping entries as per Bank of England Quarterly Report. Well, they can't prove that because that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah? Proof of claim that the bank risk any of their assets regarding the loan, uh, and if this is not the case, please prove that this was fully disclosed to the account holder. Can't do that either. Proof of claim that any contract with any element of fraud or deception is not null and void. So, if they can't prove that, it's null and void. Yeah. Um, you grant them 40 days to reply, otherwise, uh, uh, under, yeah, under the full commercial liability code, penalties of perjury. Um, and this you can put on any, any document you want to stop them from, right, uh, sort of from phoning you all the time. You can say, I wish to deal with this matter in writing. I do not give your organisation permission to contact me by telephone. I warn you that uh, any calls will constitute harassment and renders you liable for Section 1 of the Protection of the Harassment Act 1997. Okay. Now, people have used letters like this, and here's an example of one of the replies, and I know you can't read it, so I'll read it. So, um, we appreciate that under Section 78 of the Consumer Credit Act, if you decide not to meet your obligations under the credit card agreement as they fall due, that we will un be unable to take steps to enforce repayment of your card by your action. Nevertheless, we expect you to meet your obligations. <laughs> so what I'm just saying is, we can't make you pay this, you know. <laughs> so, but please pay us anyway. <laughs> yeah. So this, um, they go on to say to try and find you uh, by saying, uh, "What is it? Oh yeah. Well, if you fail, if you do not make your card payments as they call you, we'll report your default to credit reference agencies." So when you get rid of one of the uh, one of your debts with one of these letters. Um, they might threaten you that they'll put black mark against you in these credit reference agencies. All you have to do is say, go to Experian or whoever it is and say, 
Um, I dispute this debt. Yeah, I dispute this debt. Now they have to go and prove that there was a debt, uh, but they can't. So that that, that part goes away. Okay. Would there be any other uh, bank ever touch you after that? And would that stop you ever buying anything online or being able to use any kind of bank service in the future? Um, it will possibly stop you from stop them from uh, uh, loading you anything again. But uh, but you know what? Do you want? Do you really want to do that anymore? Yeah. Well, lots of stuff online. You buy stuff. No, not online. I mean, you get a loan. Any bank stuff. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, once you once you know you're being you're being shafted, do you want to carry on being shafted? You know. Anyway. That's your choice if you want to <laughs> feel free. <laughs> um, let's move on. Uh, just, on. Just a quickie bit before we get off banking. Yeah. Direct debits, I've heard that they're a bit suspect. Um, I wouldn't say suspect because there's a useful thing you can do with direct debits. For instance, if you're paying council tax with direct debits, if you, um, oh, I didn't go through the council tax, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you um, challenge your council tax in a certain way, and you, you uh, put at the end of your letter that uh, if you fail to answer my query here, um, I'm not only stop paying house tax, but I'll be seeking um, all my payments up to date, you know, back. And then you can go to the, to the bank and get a direct debit clawback back and get everything you paid them back. And then you don't have to go through the, the, the council for that, you just go to the bank. Right, so, um, yes, so, um, again, very quickly, how much time have we got? Uh, you've got five minutes. Five minutes, bloody hell. All right, um, so, presentment, things you get through the door, yeah? Um, best thing to do when you get one, um, no contract return to send up, yeah? Anything comes through the door, you, you know, you know, don't really like the look of, just scribble out the address line, right, no contract return to send up, put it back in the post box, yeah? With council tax, you do that when you first move into an area, they send you the, their letters. You just do that, just keep doing that. Eventually, they'll send somebody around to, and deliver it to you. You steam it open, go, ah, oh, that's the council. Comes you back up again, so, right, no contract return to send that, deliver it and deliver it to their offices. Okay? They don't get a handle on you. Okay? Um, yeah, very quickly. The device has got three days to respond to any presentment, yeah? That's, that's uh, 72 hours, standard business practice. If you leave it any longer than that, your silence will be deemed as consent. Okay? I can't, I've got no time, no time, no time. Um, yeah, so if you do open it, because again, it's mail fraud if you open somebody else's letters, and the name in all capital letters is not you, it's your person. So don't open it, it's not your letter. Um, so send back, if you do open it, write open an error at the top. So you, you're saying that I opened it, but I'm not consenting to be that straw man, yeah? Uh, initial notice is rejection. I'll really go quickly with this. The notice of rejection is saying that, uh, you know, you're a private company, yeah? Um, show me that I've got a contract with you, or I've breached common law in some way. Uh, if, if you can't show me I've breached common law, I reject your demand for cause without dishonour. Yeah? If, um, you have a contract, or if you can't show me a contract, I do not wish to trade with your company. Simple as that. Yeah? Um, and you can add your fee schedule. So any letters that you send or read, you can charge for it. Any emails you send, uh, any research you have to do, you can charge per hour. Yeah? You can any inconvenience fee or whatever. Yeah? But you charge for your time. Um, Ah, okay, so, common law solution, the promissory notes, okay? If you feel you have to pay, if you feel you really do have to pay, yeah, you can write a promissory note, because there's no actual money, yeah? The promissory notes you're handing around from your pocket, yeah? Well, they're just that, they're just, there's, there's no money behind them. It says, I promise to pay the bearer 20 pounds. If you go to the Bank of England and say, I want my 20 pounds, yeah? They'll give you two tens and throw you out. <laughs> yeah? Back in the past, you'd go take 20 pounds to the Bank of England, they'll give you a whole load of silver. Not anymore. There's no money. Okay? This country's been bankrupt for generations. Right? So they're all IOUs and empty promises. Yeah? So if you 
are forced to pay, right, no time, no time, no time, if you're forced to pay, right, you ask the person, the people, can you pay in cash? And if they say yes, which they will, right, you write them out promise you know, because it says in the Bill of Exchange Act, 1882, the promise you know must be treated as cash. <laughs> yeah? Um, so yeah, this is just promise you know. So this is my promise you know. It's a version that I made. I like to put it on fancy certificate paper to make it look grand. Yeah? But it's just got like, the amount in numbers, the amount in letters. Yeah? I promise to pay the variable on demand, the sum of. And I say on the here, subsequent to the Bank of England, having honoured their promises on their banknotes. They'll never honour their promises because there's no money. Yeah? So as soon as they honour their promises, I'll honour my promise. Okay? Um, so I, the difference I make with my promise, you know, is I've got a space for three witnesses. So three witnesses to sign that you signed it. Okay? That has power. Okay? I, subsequently, I subsequently found out that other people get a, uh, a notary public to, uh, to stamp it, and uh, that gives the same power as three witnesses. Okay? Are they obliged to do that for you, for a fee, the notary? Yes, they, they will charge you for that. But three witnesses will do as well. Now, this is a, this is a ruling, and more case law here, from a, from a case by Lord Denny. Okay? We've repeatedly said in this court that a bill of exchange or promise you know is to be treated as cash. It is to be honoured unless there is a good reason to the contrary. Uh, I.e. there's an arguable uh, case based on the total failure of consideration. The point is, it has to be treated as cash. Okay? Here's, um, here's a case where a borrower <coughs> used a promissory note to pay a mortgage. Okay? This guy in Ireland, right, he, he reasoned that um, back in 2010, during the bank, banking crisis, the uh, finance minister of Ireland went on television and he wrote out a promissory note for 31 billion euro. On television. He wrote this promissory note out, gave it to the Anglo-Irish um, Bank, and now they're out of debt <laughs> on the basis of this promissory note. Okay? So this guy reasoned that if the, if the finance minister can do it, well, I can too. Okay, so he wrote that. I promised them that out for the, uh, for the mortgage company and they, he got taken to court and the county registrar confirmed that it was a valid defence. He quoted the Bill of Exchange Act and Lord Denning's ruling and it was a valid defence. Now, the first thing about this is that uh, I could not find this story online. <laughs> There's nothing online about this story. I had to get the actual newspaper clipping, okay? Now, I don't know what happened about this case. But, you know, you can bet, if he lost that case, it'd be splashed all over the internet, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know, a man tries to pay his mortgage with promise, you know, he gets put in prison. Yeah? But no, there's nothing about it. So I can only conclude that he was successful with this. Okay? So, I'm going to have to with Paul Taylor Carter. Was that recent? Sorry? Was that recent? Yes, it's very recent. And I can't remember the date as well. Right, so I have not got, I'm not, I'm not quite finished, I'm not quite finished. Give me a second. Right, first of all, you've all broken the law. All of you. I don't know if you noticed my notice. <laughs> see now, right in plain sight, right in plain sight. Didn't see this. You'll see, no notice, put your mask on. <laughs> notice. By sitting in this room, you agree to the following conditions. It is an offence to say the word banana under any circumstances. It is an offence to stand on one leg. So, because of that, it's a fair call. You're all under arrest.
No, I can't. I need to have one for Santa. You're the rest you follow my orders, thank you. <laughs> see how easy that was? He followed my orders, he gave authority over to me. You see that? You answered my question, thank you. You're the rest. Hmm. Oh, so how are you today? You like me? Hello. Are you not talking to me now? You're not going to talk to me? Right, so this is Billy. Thank you! Thanks! Well done. He's learned. Stand up. I was reading you around. Stand up. Show, show. Thank you! Thank you! Thank you!
we will make plans. We will get something organised, and we'll, we'll put the message out. And uh, yeah, we'll do it again. And it was, it's kind of a whistle stop tour, isn't it? Really? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Whoosh for it. Yeah. One last thing, just to say, is we're in Sussex Assembly. We've organised this. Google us, find us, come see me afterwards. Um, and if you want to get more involved, you're very welcome to join us. There's no fee to join. Um, and we're going for drinks now at the Weather Spoons in Major Hill. You're very welcome to join us. It's a good day, obviously. We'll buy you a drink at least. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Good night.